as we go to the Word together, let us ask the Lord's blessing upon it. Father God, we do ask now for your blessing upon uh, your Word as it is preached. We ask that you would uh, provide insight and instruction to us. Lord, we ask that you would stir and stimulate our hearts to know you more and to love you more and to truly grasp what you would have us do according to your word. Our desire is to ever increasingly conform ourselves to that which you have called us to do. But Lord, we acknowledge that we cannot do this apart from your blessing, apart from your grace, because apart from you we can do nothing. And therefore, we ask for this blessing in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Alrighty, well, as it says up here on the slide, we're going to be looking at Ezra chapter 4, verses 1 through 5 today. So if you have your Bibles, I would invite you to open them up to the Old Testament book of Ezra. We're going to be looking at chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. And uh, as we now open up chapter 4 of Ezra, we're going to once again be seeing the continuation of uh, the series that we've been working through now uh, in the book of Ezra over this last month. We're going to continue to see the narrative of the Jewish people after they have returned from Babylonian captivity. And so, just in case uh, any of us are perhaps still a little fuzzy as to uh, what exactly that means when we say the Babylonian captivity or the, uh, the returning uh, from the exile, I'm just going to take this first uh, brief couple of minutes to once again explain just the sort of time period that this is taking place in so that we can better understand the historical context. Um, and so the book of Ezra itself uh, begins in chapter 1, uh, roughly around 538 B.C., when uh, the king of Persia, named Cyrus, was able to overcome the Babylonian Empire. Um, but, uh, just kind of uh, some of the history leading up to the time of the book of Ezra, just to give us that context again, uh, if you look up here on the map, um, ultimately this area here is kind of what was considered uh, the nation of Israel once Joshua led the uh, people, the, the Israelites, into the promised land and took it over. That was essentially their borders located here, kind of on the uh, Mediterranean Sea. But then, over the course of hundreds of years, once they became a monarchy in themselves, uh, under the kingship of David and Solomon, their borders uh, expanded quite a bit, actually. Uh, they were powerful militarily, they were wealthy, they were successful in basically all of their endeavors, because God's covenant blessings were upon them. And so they were quite successful. Uh, but then, unfortunately, in around uh, 930 or so BC, when King Solomon's son, Rehoboam, takes the throne, uh, he makes some foolish decisions and the kingdom itself ends up getting split between north and south. And the northern kingdom ends up losing quite a bit of the territory that they had, and, uh, and they became actually two nations. Uh, the blue nation represented here kept the name Israel. Uh, but the southern kingdom took on the name Judah because that was the primary tribe that made up that territory, right? And so they existed then in, as two nations for a couple of hundred years um, until uh, the northern kingdom of Israel in increased in their apostasy. And so true to God's covenant promises in Deuteronomy 28, he raises up the Assyrian Empire, which is a very large empire. They come in and actually conquer the northern tribe of Israel so that they were no more. And, uh, and after this happened, uh, Syria then actually tried to conquer Judah as well, but by God's gracious intervention in 2 Kings 18, while Hezekiah was king of Judah, the Lord intervenes and sends an angel of the Lord to kill 185,000 of the Assyrian army, and thus they are not conquered. And they're actually able to survive as a nation for another hundred and uh, over a hundred years after that, uh, because this conquering happened in 722 BC, uh, and then hundred, over 100 years later, unfortunately, the southern kingdom of Judah did not uh, pursue the Lord well. They uh, increased in their apostasy, and they forsook the Lord, and so God raised up another empire to actually overcome the Assyrian Empire, uh, which was Babylon, and they actually came down and destroyed the southern kingdom of Judah as well, so that they were no more. And during this time, uh, it was led by King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. He came in, he destroyed the city of Jerusalem, laid it waste, he destroyed the temple that Solomon had constructed, and then he took many of the Jews who were there and carried them off into exile back into the region of Babylon. And this happened in 586 BC, right? But then, after the Babylonian uh, captivity, where they were in exile for 70 years, 
God raises up another empire, this time the empire of Persia, which was even larger than the empires of Assyria or Babylon. And the king of Persia, as we learned in Ezra chapter 1, named Cyrus, he actually, by God's own uh, leading and directive, allows all those exiles, those Jewish exiles who were in ba uh, uh, Babylon, allows them to return back to their homeland of Judah to rebuild the city and to rebuild the temple as well. So it was a wonderful turn of events, and we saw that it all happened exactly as was uh, said to happen through the word of Jeremiah in Jeremiah 25. So all of these events are fulfilling scripture as was foretold. And so that, uh, again, it's in this time period of them being now allowed to return back to their homeland that the book of Ezra then takes place. So that's just a bit of a little historical backdrop leading into our passage. And so not only, though, did we, have we examined this history, but we have seen that then the major emphasis of much of the book of Ezra, and then leading into the book of uh, Nehemiah as well, deals with the theme of Reformation. The idea of reforming the nation back to covenant faithfulness to the Lord. Because they had recognized they had gone into exile and they were judged by the Lord for their apostasy and their faithlessness in the first place. And so now that God has graciously allowed them to return, they go to great lengths to make sure that they don't commit those same acts of apostasy again. And so they're very meticulous on trying to make sure they do exactly as the Lord said to do in His Word and in His law. Right? And so we have been uh, seeing that because they are emphasizing the idea of reformation, uh, therefore as a church then, applying it even to today, we too have been emphasizing the theme or the idea of reformation and how that looks even in our uh, culture and in our community right now in the 21st century. How can we as a church be striving to pursue the Lord, to be preaching the gospel and to be calling the uh, place where God has placed us right here to be coming to faith in Christ and to obey Jesus as King, right? This is the, the task of reformation that we have been given from the Lord Jesus. You know, the Great Commission says to go into all the world, to make disciples of all the nations, to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and to teach them all that Christ has commanded us. And so this is a very daunting task. Sometimes we feel like it might be impossible, as I've said before, because, you know, after all, we're a small church. This is a big region, and there's a lot of wickedness out there. And we're kind of bombarded with it a lot in the social media and in the news. And sometimes it can feel very uh, depressing or overwhelming. But despite how impossible it might feel, we fulfill this great commission and we strive for it in faith all the same because... Uh, this is what the Lord has called us to do. And we don't base our obedience on how, you know, possible the end goal might be, but we do it because this is what the Lord has called us to do, and we trust in faith that He will then work it out. And so, uh, as we've worked through Ezra, we have noted a handful of principles of Reformation that we see them do to this end of reforming the nation. And so, how can we then take what they're doing and apply it to our lives today? Understanding all the time that as we look at these principles, these are not a simple formula. That if we technically just jump through all of these hoops, then God is basically forced to provide reformation. Uh, this is a gift from the Lord by His grace, and He is free to give it or to withhold it at His own choice. Um, but in faith, as we apply these principles, we trust that God perhaps may be merciful and in fact produce the reformation that we desire. So, the first one that we saw, if we desire reformation, is that we must trust in the promises of God. We saw this in chapter 1. We saw, again, how God fulfilled all of the promises that he had spoken through the prophets, specifically Jeremiah and Isaiah. And he did it against what we would consider as human odds. And he just, he did the impossible. And so, if we desire reformation today, we too must trust in the promises that God has made, specifically the promises of victory, to conquer the world through the gospel. And the knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth like, not, uh, like waters cover the sea, as it says in Habakkuk 2.14. So we trust in the promises of God. We saw, secondly, in chapter 2, that if we desire reformation, then it will simply take people. We saw that in that big list of names that are mentioned, um, Simply put, God, in his providence, uses his people to bring about the, the things that he desires. Does he need people? No. God can accomplish anything he wants simply by speaking it into existence. But yet, in his, again, wise providence, he decides to use people to bring about what he longs for. And so, we strive to this. We know it takes people. Thirdly, we saw that the people uh, in chapter 3 prioritized worship. The very moment they get back into the land of Jerusalem, they immediately gather as one man, it says, to worship the Lord. 
And this was specifically done by uh, building the altar and building the temple, both of which were absolutely vital in their worship of the Lord, and both of them had been destroyed by the Babylonians decades before. And so from the altar and the temple, we saw the principles from that is if we prioritize worship, we are to do so with clean hands and a pure heart through faith in Jesus. This is what really the altar symbolized. It's the idea of having your sins cleansed so that you can come into the presence of the Lord in worship. And so let it be known that we don't go to a physical altar with physical sacrifices any longer, but we go to the one who it was all pointing to, and that is Jesus. And we come in faith, and through faith, then that once and for all sacrifice of Christ at the cross is then applied to us, and our sins are forever and permanently cleansed and forgiven. And so we come in this way, and then secondly, as we prioritize worship, we know that this also means that we then commit to the work that he has called us to do with joyous praise and not pessimistic weeping. We saw this last week when they built the temple. Uh, the temple was what God had specifically called them to do, and we saw many of them when they were able to just simply lay the foundation. They were making just inches of progress, but that inches of progress was worthy of praising the Lord for. And so many of them did. They shouted for joy. But there was another population of people there who were not pleased because they were old enough to actually remember Solomon's temple. And Solomon's temple, frankly, just looked better. It was more grand, it was probably bigger, and it was more stupendous. And so when they looked at Solomon's temple compared to the foundation of what they were able to lay, they were discouraged and not very happy. And we saw that we shouldn't fall into that camp or that category, but rather we should also be joyously praising the Lord for any sort of progress towards reformation that we can, in fact, make. And so that's what we've essentially, in a very, again, somewhat succinct fashion, been looking at over the last month as we've examined Ezra. And that is then going to bring us right into our passage for today, which again is Ezra chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. So let's read it in its entirety. This is the word of the Lord. Now, when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the returned exiles were building a temple to the Lord, the God of Israel, they approached Zerubbabel and the heads of fathers' houses and said to them, Let us build with you, for we worship your God as you do, and we have been sacrificing to him ever since the days of Esarhaddon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. But Zerubbabel, Jeshua, and the rest of the heads of fathers' houses in Israel said to them, you have nothing to do with us in building a house to our God, but we alone will build to the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. Then the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah and made them afraid to build and bribed counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. All right, so... That is going to be the passage of Scripture that we examined for this morning, and uh, in it, we actually see here, what we just read, is the first overt form of opposition that the Jews face once they've now returned back into the land. Because up to this point, in everything we've just been kind of uh, recapping, things had been going more or less rather smoothly. Uh, they've been able to return to the land in the first place. They've been able to rebuild the altar. They've been able to reestablish the sacrifices. They've been able to lay the foundation of the temple. And so things are going quite uh, well. Uh, but then, in our text today, again, because we see that we're in this spiritual war, you can count on it that once genuine strides towards biblical reformation start to be made, there, Satan will appear to try and thwart and stop all of that progress. Right? This is what he does. And in fact, this is going to be the basic principle that we're working with this morning. That uh, reformation, true biblical reformation, will be attacked. It will be attacked by Satan to try and stop it and thwart it and sabotage the whole process. Uh, in the words of the Puritan Thomas Watson, he said that it must not be expected that the devil will let those rest who are laboring to destroy his kingdom. Right? And that's true. I mean, as Christians, as we, in faith, seek to obey the Lord Jesus, as we seek to apply the Word of God to every single facet of our existence, and we do this all life long, uh, not only are we then uh, contributing to the advance of the kingdom of God, but uh, then simultaneously we are, as it were, tearing away the foundations of everything that Satan is trying to do. And clearly he does not like that, and so he will try to stop us. 
the devil is our great adversary who works night and day to sabotage the works of God. Uh, Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 5 that the devil himself is like a roaring lion who is seeking someone to devour. Right? And that imagery that Peter is employing there is used for a purpose. Uh, if you've ever seen a, a, a video of a lion actually hunting its prey, some gazelle or deer or antelope or whatever they hunt, if you've ever seen videos of this, then you know that uh, lions can be incredibly patient, they can be incredibly crafty, I mean, kind of all feline animals have this, that kind of look to it when they're crouching through the, the tall grass, and they're able usually to actually get just within a couple of feet of these deer or these antelope, which are usually kind of hypersensitive in the first place, but even then, they're able to get very close, uh, and then once they finally do lunge and attack, usually they're able to catch the deer because they're so close. Right, and that's the imagery that Scripture uses to describe the work of Satan. Satan is very crafty, he's very cunning, he's very patient, and he's very deadly. And so because of this reality, uh, and in light of that illustration, because now technically that would make us the antelope in the illustration, uh, because of this, therefore, we must not be naive to his schemes, we must not be naive to the very fact that Satan is going to attack us. It's what he does. The, problem, the, the scripture describes him as doing just that. And so because of that, again, that's what we're going to actually see in our text uh, as it unfolds. And uh, before we actually then begin to work through the text, though, uh, just noted that um, Satan, when he does attack, like a lion, uh, the, the weapons and the tactics that he can actually use are many. He's got many weapons in his arsenal, and uh, he knows how to, you know, he knows the chinks in all of our armor, and he knows how to, you know, attack each person quite well. Uh, but fundamentally, what we know from Satan is that uh, when he does attack us, he will try to sneak his way into the inside so that he can attack, attack from within, or he will just, you know, barrage us from the outside and attack us from the outside. I mean, that's kind of just basic, how else could he attack? But he either tries to attack from the inside or from the outside, and uh, what we see, what we just read in our text, actually, we see him do both things. So, with that said, let's actually walk through the text, see how Satan is trying to attack them, and then we will take that and apply it to our life today, even as the church now, in the 21st century. So, uh, verses 1 and 2 of the passage, it said, Now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the returned exiles were building a temple to the Lord, the God of Israel, they approached Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel was serving as the governor basically at this time. Uh, he was in the line of David, so he was basically just kind of the, the overall ruler of this project. He approached Zerubbabel and the heads of fathers' houses and said to them, Let us build with you, for we worship your God as you do. And we have been sacrificing to him ever since the days of Esarhaddon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. All right, so right off the bat here in verses 1 and 2, we are immediately introduced to, it says, the adversaries of our text. As we just got done saying, uh, whenever there is true biblical reform uh, taking place, there you can count on it that Satan will send adversaries to try and stop that progress. And that's what's happening here. Right? They, it says, heard that they are rebuilding the temple. The temple in the Old Covenant was fundamental in the worship of the Lord. And so if they're able to rebuild the temple, they're able to really reestablish true and genuine worship of the living God. And this is something clearly that Satan does not want to happen. And so once he hears that that's what they're doing, what does he send? He sends the adversaries to try and stop the work. Now, uh, it's interesting, though, that when he does send these adversaries... He initially does not just send them, uh, you know, where they just come announcing themselves as adversaries, you know, like, we're here to stop everything you're doing. Uh, Satan does do that at times, but he doesn't do that here, but rather it tells us that uh, they come really disguised as friends, and they, they come, you know, disguised with friendliness. They said, hey, let us build with you, right? We want to help in this project, because after all, we worship your God just, just we, we all worship the same God here. We're all on the same team. If you help, if you let us help you build the, the temple, then we'll be able to reestablish it all the faster. We'll be able to re, uh, be, or redo our uh, worship of the Lord all the quicker. Here, let, let's all work together. We'll get it done really, really fast. Which, no doubt, sounds good. Sound, doesn't sound too bad. But notice their response in verse 3. It says, But Zerubbabel, Jeshua, who is the high priest at this time, and the rest of the heads of fathers' houses in Israel said to them, 
You have nothing to do with us in building a house to our God. For we alone will build to the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. All right, so if we didn't actually know the, the broader context or some of the historical context here, uh, we would almost get the impression that the Jews are being a little rude to these people. Uh, because, after all, they seem quite neighborly. They come down, they offer to help, and essentially, in response, they're told to beat him, right? You have nothing to do with us here. Uh, you're not going to help us. We're going to do it all by ourselves. Thank you very much. You can leave, right? And so, again, it's, it's almost, you know, why so aggressive? Why so hostile, seemingly? Uh, why so blunt? Well, again, it's important to understand and remember the context of what we're dealing with if we actually go back to verses 1 and 2, which we just looked at a moment ago. We shouldn't forget, it said in verse 1, that these are, in fact, adversaries of the Lord. And so uh, we need to read what we are reading in that context. These are enemies of the Lord, and so now they're being responded to like enemies. At which point we might still say, but they don't seem like enemies. They seem very friendly. They seem nice. They seem kind. It seems like they're just wanting to help. <coughs> but that, again, just goes to show that uh, this, as we just said a couple of moments ago, this is one of the ways that Satan so often works. He comes by trying to sneak his way into the inside of some sort of group so that he can wreak havoc from the inside. And, uh, and so in this case, if you have to sneak in onto the inside, you have to disguise yourself as a friend uh, before you reveal yourself as a foe. Or as uh, Paul would say in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14, Satan often masquerades as an angel of light. Satan knows how to come off as godly and to appear as godly. And one of the main ways that he actually attacks uh, the people of God is by actually offering a hand of help. Right? You know, like, you've, you've got an issue. Here, I, I can help you with that. Here, you, you, this, is, this is troubling you. You're stressed about this. Here, I can help with that. Here. And then he, he employs some sort of form of help, which on the outside always looks like might be pretty good. But Satan always has a, a hook underneath the worm. And he's always got some sort of angle behind his help. And, uh, and that's what he's doing here. Uh, but it's effective because offering help is a godly thing to do. God desires us to help one another. And so, as Satan so often does, he takes what is godly and good and right, and he warps it and he twists it to, for his own purposes. And in this text, these adversaries come and they offer help to rebuild the temple, right? I mean, we'll, we'll help, you know, carry the stones. We'll help, you know, do the wheelbarrows. We'll help take all of the debris away. This will be very good. We'll, we'll be able to get this all very fast. But there is a secret agenda behind what Satan is doing here. And uh, the secret agenda is actually, we learn more about what he's actually up to uh, by what they're actually saying in the second half of verse 2. It's kind of, they kind of tip themselves off when they say that Esar Haddon, the king of Assyria, was the ones who had brought them to where they were. Now that's important to remember because this event of the king of Assyria bringing them to where they were is actually referenced elsewhere in scripture, specifically in 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 24 through 33 and verse 41, which you can turn to if you'd like, otherwise you can just listen, because I'm going to read it. And, uh, but at this time, again, if you remember that map that we showed at the beginning, when the nation of Assyria came down and conquered the northern kingdom of Israel, um, we actually learn about what happens after that in 2 Kings chapter 17, starting in verse 24. Listen to what it says. It says, And the king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, Kutha, Ava, Hamath, and Sepharvaim, and placed them in the cities of Samaria, instead of the people of Israel. And they took possession of Samaria, which was the capital city of Israel at the time, and they lived in its cities. And at the beginning of their dwelling there, they did not fear the Lord. Therefore the Lord sent lions among them, which killed some of them. So the king of Assyria was told, The nations that you have carried away and placed in the cities of Samaria do not know the law of God, the God of the land. Therefore he has sent lions among them, and behold, they are killing them, because they do not know the law of the God of the land. Then the king of Assyria commanded, Send there one of the priests whom you carried away from there, and let him go and dwell there and teach them the law of the God of the land. So one of the priests whom they had carried away from Samaria came and lived in Bethel and taught them how they should fear the Lord. But every nation still made gods of its own 
and put them in the shrines of the high places that the Samaritans had made, every nation in the cities in which they lived. The men of Babylon made Shekoth Benoth, the men of Kuth made Nergal, the men of Hamath made Ashima, and the Avites made Nibhaz and Tartak, and the Sephirvites burned their children in the fire to Adramelech and Anamelech, the gods of Sephirvain. They also feared the Lord and appointed from among themselves all sorts of people as priests of the high places, who sacrificed for them in the shrines of the high places. So they feared the Lord, but also served their own gods after the manner of the nations from, whom, from among whom they had been carried away. And then verse 41 after that says that their children did likewise, and their children's children, as their fathers did, so they do to this day. All right, so, in other words, what that just said was, if we actually go back to our map, which we had looked at before, the nation of Israel and the nation of Judah was there. The nation of Assyria, which is outlined here, came over and they conquered uh, the, the northern kingdom of Israel, right? But many of the other places that they had conquered in that area were mentioned in 2 Kings chapter 17. And uh, one of them was Babylon and Kutha and Abia and Sepharvaim and Hamath. And it says once they conquered all of those places, they actually took exiles from all of those places and sent them to go live in Israel, what was once Israel, specifically in the city of Samaria. And so all of these people went and lived in Samaria and they intermarried with one another and thus would then eventually become known as the Samaritans. And that is why the Samaritans were so despised even down into the time of Jesus. Because, frankly, they weren't even real Jews. They were Jews and half Jew and half Babylon, uh, Babylonians. And half Jews and half, you know, all the other places that had come and dwelt there. Right? And so uh, they despised them for that reason. Which might sound a little racist, and it might have been in some cases, but it wasn't just because they were now ethnically no longer Jews, but it was also because, as the text made clear, uh, they then also brought all of their gods from all of those places and brought their idols then into Israel itself. So that the text said, uh, they feared the Lord, but they also served other gods uh, as well. Right? And their children did this, and their children's children, and so on and so forth. And so ultimately they became syncretistic. They would do a little bit of things where it's like, okay, we'll worship the Lord in these ways, but we'll also adopt some of these pagan practices as well. And they really, in, in many ways, became polytheistic. They began to serve many different gods, uh, the Lord God being just one amongst many. And therefore, when you actually go back to our text in Ezra chapter 4, when they went to the, to the Jews in Jerusalem and said, let us help you, we worship your God, Just we, we all worship the same God here. Right? We now see, actually, from this context that they did not worship the same God. Uh, it might have sounded true and maybe a little bit okay on the surface, because, yes, technically they served the Lord, but they didn't serve the Lord alone. They served the Lord with many other gods and many other pagan practices. And so, uh, because of this, uh, the Jews refused to uh, um, allow them to join them in the work. Because ultimately, if they allowed these people, these Samaritans, to come down and do the work, then they would ultimately get some sort of say in how the temple was rebuilt, and then they would even potentially get some sort of say in how the worship at the temple goes. And this is again Satan's ploy. If he can get a somewhat of a little foothold into how the worship there goes, uh, just a little bit of pagan practice here and a little bit of pagan practice there would eventually creep in and the whole thing would be corrupted. And uh, the Jews recognized that that was the whole reason why they were sent into exile in the first place by God's judgment. And so now they do not play games here. They do not flirt around with compromise. When they say, hey, let us build with you, they say, we cannot do this. We cannot compromise the worship of the living God through your practices. And so they refuse it. And really, they should be commended for doing so because they are, uh, in fact, uh, resisting what Satan is attempting. Satan was trying to get in and infuse his idolatry into their practices. It was the uh, Trojan horse technique, the, uh, the wolf in sheep's clothing strategy. You can get inside, you can wreak a lot of havoc once you're in there. And it's actually because of this very reason that Paul would then also warn churches in 2 uh, Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 through 16, which is often referenced in, 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 uh, as it pertains to marriage, which is a true uh, way to apply this, but it also can refer to even ministries and churches. He says, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? 
Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? And the presupposed answer is none. There is no connection between those things, and therefore uh, churches should ultimately not be partnering with the world in their ministry efforts. Uh, by all means, we do ministry to the world. It's not like we can never have any association with unbelievers because Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5, we would have to leave the world then in order to somehow be completely separate. But we do not do, so we don't become completely separate. We do ministry to them. We preach the gospel to them so that they are saved. But we do not partner with them and then allow them to have a say in how we do ministry things. Uh, and this is just, uh, again, a good principle because as Paul would also say in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. And it's for this very reason, again, that, uh, you know, people, churches ignoring this uh, um, exhortation from Paul, that many churches have unfortunately gone incredibly liberal and very, very worldly, right? Uh, but again, Satan is very crafty. He will often come to churches uh, under the disguise of wanting unity. It's a big one, right? Unity is a virtue of the Lord. Uh, God says, or the Lord Jesus says, you know, he wants us to be one just as he and the Father are one. So we should be one. We should want unity. But then he'll come and push this so very hard that we begin to think, well, we have to be one no matter what sort of distinctions we have. Uh, all of these distinctions are bad unity at all costs. And eventually you begin to partner with other denominations or other groups of people who have very questionable theologies or even just outright heretical theologies. And, uh, and so eventually when they start to accept the hand of help offered from the world, a.k.a. from Satan, uh, that is when, before you know it, you have women serving as pastors and as elders and in other positions of authority within the church. You have um, homosexuals uh, wanting to, you know, celebratory homosexuals wanting to uh, become full members, serve in church leadership. You have even in more recent uh, history the, the, the woke ideologies and the critical race theory uh, being very much pushed and advocated for. Eventually the scripture itself is, is pushed off to the wayside and in replacement of entertainment. And on and on and on it goes. Right? This is what happens when churches begin to partner with the world. They become increasingly worldly. Right? Bad, bad company ruins good morals. And so, uh, this is something that we do need to be very careful of, because when you do, when you become, when you become corrupted in this way, then churches will increasingly become ineffective. And when you become ineffective long enough, you actually become a hindrance to the kingdom, uh, the work, kingdom work that we're uh, called to do. And so, because of this, uh, just again, taking all of that and applying it even to us today as a church, we therefore need to be very careful um, in all of our... Uh, Dealings, because we know that Satan will in fact try to infiltrate our ranks. Uh, it's not a fun thought to think about, but this is something that he will try to do. Uh, we, uh, if you remember, way back when we were going through the book of Acts, uh, chapter 20, um, there was a time when Paul actually met with the Ephesian elders in chapter 20 of Acts, and he says, um, uh, starting in verse 29, so he's, he's exhorting them, he's teaching them, and he says, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. And this is one of the things Satan so loves and longs to do. If he can get his foothold in the door and get within the ranks of the church, he can create a lot of havoc from there. So we do need to be wise and discerning uh, regarding who we partner with as a church and who serves as leadership in the church and who serves just in every other function within the church. We have to be very wise and discerning in these matters, which does not mean we should just be cripplingly suspicious about any offer of help that we ever perhaps may receive in the future, but we also do not want to be naive to the fact that we are in a spiritual war with a very real spiritual enemy who hates us, who hates this church, and wants to see it go under. Right? So we do need to be real, uh, aware of that. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians 2.11, let us not be outwitted by Satan or ignorant of his designs. And so, that's the first way that we see Satan so often try to attack, by trying to get himself inside so he can ruin it. Uh, but in our text, to their credit, to the Jews' credit, they don't allow it. Right? They resisted this attack from Satan. And so what happens? Does Satan say, nuts, I've been thwarted, I guess I'll never come again. But, uh, of course, he does not do that. He, uh, as it says in the temptation account in Luke, I believe it is, when Jesus, when he tempted say, uh, Jesus over and over and over again in the wilderness three times, it says after that he left until an opportune time. 
right? He'll be back. Uh, he's not going to just leave you for good. He'll come back at another time when you're weak, when you're vulnerable. And so that's what he does. And we see now him come back in another form of attack in verses 4 and 5 of the text, which, which is as far as we're going today. He says, it says, Then the people of the land, which were the adversaries in verse 1, they discouraged the people of Judah and made them afraid to build and bribed counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Mm. All right, so Satan was not able at this time to use these adversaries to get on the inside, and so what does he do? He uses them to attack from the outside. And specifically, he does so in three different ways. It says he then discouraged the people, he made them afraid to build, continue the work, and he brought in counselors against them to frustrate all of their purposes. This is the threefold method that Satan now employs against the Jewish people. And uh, we don't get all of the nitty gritty details of exactly how he does these things, but in the words of Derek Thomas, it was probably through a campaign of physical and psychological intimidation and threats. Right? The, they just probably bombarded the people in Jerusalem by constantly sh pointing out how utterly futile their work was. I mean, do you really think that rebuilding this temple is ever going to work? Do you actually think anything is going to come of it? Uh, I mean, do, do you think it's, it's, it's certainly not as good as Solomon's temple? Everything you're doing here looks awfully, awfully horrible and shabby. Uh, why even continue? Why even bother? You're wasting your time. Right, if you hear this over and over and over again about the work that you're called to do, this can be indeed very discouraging uh, in, in the process of doing the work. Not only that, but it says that uh, they, they made them afraid. Right? And so they were being, no doubt, intimidated. They were probably being threatened about what will happen if you keep doing the work. All right? If you don't stop, we're coming after you. Right? We're going to come after your family. We're going to come after your children. We're going to come after your livelihood. Do you love your family? Do you want food on your table, then simple enough, just stop working on the temple, right? It's very simple, right? They're using this intimidation. They're making them afraid to go on building. And then lastly, as we again seen, they bribe the people to frustrate their purposes. They're hiring out uh, individuals to just make the work difficult. And we're actually going to see more of these details of how they do this, actually in the second half of chapter 4, which we'll see, uh, Lord willing, next week. But basically, they're, they're hiring people in the high up places to just make all of their efforts very, very difficult, and thus again, their work is being frustrated. Uh, so those are, that's the three-pronged way in which Satan is now attacking from the outside. And uh, as I was preparing, I thought it was just very fascinating. In light of this threefold tactic, uh, I'm not a prophet, and I'm not, uh, I don't have divine revelation given to me about all of these things. It's, it's pertaining to what I'm about to say. But... I think it's very fascinating that this is how Satan attacked them in 500 and the 530s BC, and how very similar his tactics continue to be even today against the church in the 21st century, especially over the last year and a half uh, with everything that's gone on in the world and in our nation. I mean, this, this is just kind of the playbook that he's been running. He's been trying to do everything he can to discourage Christians and the church from even gathering together and fellowshipping with one another. He's been doing much to make many Christians very afraid to gather together and worship as the saints. He has been doing a lot, uh, you know, to frustrate the purposes of Christians getting together and do the work. If you actually do resist all of the things that they're trying to make us adhere to, right, which is quite difficult because... Frankly, it's always changing. You know, you have to do this, and then actually, no, you don't have to do that anymore, but you do have to do this. But if you do this, then you don't have to do that anymore, but actually, wait, no, you do still have to do this, even if you do that. And the things are constantly changing. They're constantly moving the goalposts. And if you provide any sort of resistance against this, then you will often be ridiculed. You will often be mocked. You will often be maligned in some form or fashion. Uh, you will, the people, they'll try to make you, uh, people look at you with disdain. Right? This is what he did in the 530s, discourage, make you afraid, ridicule, and it's what he continues to do against the church even today. And, as we see in this text, notice that this goes on from the time of Cyrus all the way to the time of Darius. Now, Cyrus is when they're currently uh, at, he was, so this would probably be in the 537, 536 BC time, and Darius doesn't come to the throne until 522 BC, and he then serves for many years after that. And so 
they are experiencing this discouragement, this intimidation, these threats, all of these oppositions for at least 15 years. It's just, it's going on for at least, it could have gone on even further. So the junky part about all of this is that Satan can often persist in these oppositions for decades. It can just go on and on and on. It can feel like it's never going to stop. And uh, in fact, again, next week we're going to see how they continue to oppose them uh, so much that the actual temple project that they are undergoing right now is going to be halted and then essentially put on hold for about 20 years. And so, indeed, uh, the first attack by trying to get inside was resisted, but then the second attack from the outside seems to have been a bit more effective, and, and, and the temple is put on hold for 20 years. Uh, and so, but that's, again, what we're going to see next week, Lord willing. For now, having just walked through the text, verses 1 through 5, by way of summary, we see that, again, uh, just um, from all of it, we see that the principle for today is that Reformation will be attacked. If we truly desire and genuinely strive to do that which Christ has called us to do in his word, Satan will try to thwart those purposes. And he will often try to attack from the inside and ruin it from there, or he will attack from the outside to discourage, frighten, or frustrate our purposes. Uh, I included a quote in the bulletin this morning um, by C.H. McIntosh, which kind of just highlights everything we've just been looking at. He said this, Quote, it is a serious reflection for the evangelist that wherever God's spirit is at work, there Satan is sure to be busy. We must remember and ever be prepared for this. The enemy of Christ and the enemy of souls is always on the watch, always hovering about to see what he can do, either to hinder or corrupt the work of the gospel. Now this need not terrify or even discourage the workmen, but it is well to bear it in mind and be watchful. Satan will leave no stone unturned to mar or hinder the blessed work of God's Spirit. He has proved himself the ceaseless, vigilant enemy of that work from the days of Eden down to the present moment. Again, that's basically everything we just saw in our text. And so, because of this, because we know that Satan is going to try to attack anything that we even do as a church, as we strive to reform not only ourselves but the surrounding region, if we know Satan is going to try and attack this, the exhortation or the application I would extend to us is very simply then, be on guard against the schemes of the devil. Right? Be on guard against it. Uh, as we already alluded to in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, uh, Peter says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Right? Because we know that he's going to attack, it's not if he'll attack, but he will attack. And so because he will, we must be sober-minded, we must be watchful, we must be on guard. We must constantly be on guard e even amongst one another so that wolves do not come within the church. We must be on guard from becoming discouraged uh, and despondent in our particular circumstances. We must be on guard against fear and anxiety in what is happening in the broader culture around us. And we must be on guard from becoming frustrated at uh, all of the things that serve to hinder anything we might do. This is what Satan does. He tries to make you feel these things, right? He tries to make you feel frustrated. He tries to make you feel afraid. He tries to make you feel very discouraged in your work, in your home, within your family, in the church, in your own head. This is how he wants you to feel so that you quit and so that you just give up. This is what he's after, and therefore we must be on guard. So you ask, how do we be on guard? There could be many different answers, true, biblical, godly answers to this question, but I'm going to simply suggest very briefly two things that we should be doing to stay on guard against the schemes of the devil. Number one, practice the spiritual disciplines. Right? Make this a practice in your life. Uh, what this simply means is read the Word. Right? Be immersed all the time in the Word of God. Read it, memorize it, study it, Meditate upon it, which means you're thinking about what you're reading. Hear it preached, not just on Sunday, but even throughout the week. Listen to sermons. Just immerse yourself over and over again in the Word of God. Also, pray. Pray without ceasing. Uh, ask, seek, and knock, as we said at the start of our time. That our, our life should be somewhat of a con con uh, continual, just every, all throughout the day you're offering up little prayers unto the Lord. And then you're also setting aside time, I would even say, to also uh, go to the Lord, like Jesus says, in the closet where no one can see. And there the Father who sees in secret will hear. 
uh, gather for worship like we're doing right now. This is very, very important. In light of how hard we have seen the opposition of the church try to res- or, you know, pre- prevent people from gathering as a church over this last year and a half, goes to show how utterly important that it is for us to actually gather in faith and worship the Lord together. We should be taking communion. We should be fellowshipping with one another, not just on Sunday mornings, but even throughout the week as we have opportunity. We should be repenting of our sins when we sin. We should be seeking forgiveness and extending forgiveness when that is necessary. We should be singing praises to God. Again, not just Sunday morning, but even throughout the week. And we should just be like bursting into song. It should, it should be like a musical almost, where you just, you just start singing in gratitude to how good the Lord is. We should be discipled, we should be seeking to be discipled by older, mature saints who have been walking with the Lord for a long time, and we should be seeking opportunities to even disciple those under us so that they can also grow up in the faith. We should be committing ourselves to all of these very basic principles or these very basic spiritual disciplines all our life long, and we do them in faith. Because obviously everything I just said could theoretically be done just by going through the motions so I can check off the box so that I can technically say I did them. Obviously, that is not the heart that we want to do it in, but rather, genuinely, in faith, we want to be practicing these things, because this is how you actually prepare your heart to be guarded. But at the same time, there's kind of an ironic little twist here, because the more you actually begin to do these things and take these things seriously, as we've just got done saying, the more Satan is actually going to try and attack you. But if you're not doing anything, he'll just be content to, you know, remain the status quo and just not actually bother you. But when you actually get serious in pursuing the Lord in faith, then he's going to take you more serious and he's going to attack you. But that shouldn't stop us then from doing all of these things because this is how you actually guard yourself against his attacks. So there's kind of like an interesting little cycle there. But practice the spiritual disciplines. And then lastly, uh, none of them would even be important if we then did not remember who we belong to. So that's the second thing, right? To guard yourself against the attacks of Satan, remember who you belong to, right? Namely, by grace, through faith in Jesus. If you have been born again, if you belong to Christ... Right? then you are truly, in the most uh, supreme sense of the way, secure. Right? Christ loses none whom the Father gives to him. If the, Christ, if, if the Son has set you free, then you are free indeed. You're, not, you're no longer slaves to sin, but rather you are slaves, or you are, you know, you, yeah, slaves unto the Lord. You are his servants. You belong to him. He owns you, and there is security in this. As we actually sung this morning from Martin Luther, when he says, Though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, We will not fear, for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. And so, to guard yourself against Satan, remember who you belong to. And I just want to now conclude, ultimately, by actually reading a very brief devotional that I actually read uh, from Charles Spurgeon, the 19th century Prince of Preachers from London, England. Uh, He wrote this in 1868, and it's very relevant to everything we've just been saying this morning. It's titled, Hope in Hopeless Cases. So listen, he says, How is it that Satan has the impudence to make men despair? Surely it is a piece of his infernal impertinence that he dares to do it. Despair when you have an omnipotent God to deal with you? Despair when the precious blood of the Son of God is given for sinners? Despair when God delights in mercy? Despair when the silver bell rings? Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Despair while life lasts, while mercy's gates stands wide open, while the heralds of mercy beckon you to come, while though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. I say again, it is infernal impertinence that he has dared to suggest the idea of despair to a sinner. Christ unable to save? Never can it be. Christ outdone by Satan and by sin? Impossible. A sinner with diseases too many for the great physician to heal? I tell you that if all the diseases of men were met in you, and all the sins of men were heaped on you, and if blasphemy, murder, fornication, adultery, and every sin that is possible or imaginable had all been committed by you, yet the precious blood of Jesus Christ, God's dear Son, cleanseth us from all sin. If you will but trust my Master, who is worthy to be trusted and deserves your confidence, he will save you even now. Why delay? Why raise questions? Why debate? Why deliberate? Mistrust and suspect. 
Fall into his arms. He cannot reject you, for he has himself said, Him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Yet I do despair of converting you unless the master does it. It is mine to tell you this, but I know that you will not hear it, or hearing it you will reject it, unless Christ shall come in power by his Spirit. Oh, may he come today. I love that. Despair? When the precious blood of Jesus has been given for sinners? May it never be. So, in conclusion, don't despair. Don't become despondent. Don't fall for the tactics of Satan when he attacks us in all of these ways. But rather, in faith, through Christ, let us truly resist the devil and he will flee. And because we belong to the living Christ. Let's pray. Father God, we do praise you and we thank you for the time that you have just given us today. Lord, for everything that we've been able to look at from your word. It is a blessing and it is a gift. And so we ask that you would now apply it to our lives. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for sending Christ Jesus, your son, to live a perfect life, to die an atoning death, to rise to glorious new life, to ascend in triumph to heaven, to reign with power at your right hand, to reconcile the world to yourself through the gospel. Lord, this is an incredible, incredible victory that you have produced and, 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 and given to us. Lord, and so as recipients of your saving grace, Lord, by faith in Jesus, we pray that you would now equip us for the day of battle, that you would equip us in the time of temptation so that when Satan attacks, and we know he will, Lord, when he tries to attack and infiltrate our own ranks, or when he tries to simply attack us from the outside and discourage us, or frustrate our purposes, or frighten us to stop pursuing you. Lord, in that very moment, I pray that you would give us the strength to never succumb to his attacks, but rather, in the power of the Spirit, that you would truly help us to resist him and to flee to you as our steadfast refuge and our ever-present help in time of need. Lord, we pray this so that your gospel would go forth, your kingdom advance, and your glory abound. For we ask it in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. The charge for this morning is this, that as we just got done singing, Jesus, our true Savior, went to the hillside of Calvary, and there he shed his blood as an atonement for sins once and for all. And uh, because of this, our measureless debt, which we could never have paid off ourselves, he paid it, sponged it away forever, permanently. It's gone as far as the east is from the west uh, because of the sacrifice that he made. And it is now applied to us through faith in him. And so, because of this, because we have been redeemed by his precious blood, let us now go out our separate ways this morning and truly live unto the Lord and unto his glory. Knowing that when we do, Satan, this fierce lion, will attack us, but we need not fear that because we have been redeemed by Christ, the lion of the tribe of Judah, and he's the one who has all power and authority in heaven and on earth. And so we can go out with genuine victory over sin uh, because of all that Christ has done and are, united, are being united to him through faith. So... Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Amen. Amen.